British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan gave his Wind of Change speech in Parliament, Cape Town, South Africa, on 3rd of February 1960. It marked the end of the British Empire. President, Speaker, Ministers, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great privilege to be invited to address the members of both Houses of Parliament in the Union of South Africa. It is a unique privilege to do so in 1960. The wind of change is blowing through this continent, and whether we like it or not, this growth of national consciousness is a political fact. And we must all accept it as a fact. And our national policies must take account of it. It is a basic principle of our modern Commonwealth that we respect each other's sovereignty in matters of internal policy. At the same time, we must recognize that in this shrinking world in which we live today, the internal policies of one nation may have effects outside it. So we may sometimes be tempted to say, mind your own business. But in these days, I would expand the old saying so that it runs, mind your own business, of course, but mind how it affects my business, too. If I may be very frank, I would venture to say now this. What governments and parliaments in the United Kingdom have done since the last war in according independence to India, Pakistan, Ceylon, Malaya, and Ghana, and what they will do for Nigeria and other countries now nearing independence, all this, although we must take and do take full and sole responsibility for it, we do in the belief that it is the only way to establish the future of the Commonwealth and of the free world on sound foundation. Our judgment of right and wrong and of justice is rooted in the same soil as yours. In Christianity and in the rule of law as the basis of a free society. This experience of our own explains why it has been our aim in the countries for which we have borne responsibility, not only to raise the material standards of life, but to create a society which respects the rights of individuals, a society in which men are given the opportunity to grow to their full <coughs> stature. And that must, in our view, include the opportunity of an increasing share in political power and responsibility. A society, finally, in which individual merit and individual merit alone is the criterion for man's advancement, whether political or economic. Finally, in countries inhabited by several different races, it has been our aim to find means by which the community can become more of a community and fellowship fostered between its different parts. This problem, sir, is by no means confined to Africa, nor is it always a problem of a European minority. In Malaya, for instance, though there are Indian and European minorities, Malays and Chinese make up the great bulk of the population, and the Chinese are not much fewer in number than the Malays. Yet these two peoples must learn to live together in harmony and unity, and the strength and future of Malaya as a nation will depend on the different contributions which the two races can make. The attitude of the United Kingdom government towards this problem was clearly expressed by the Foreign Secretary, Mr. Selwyn Lloyd, speaking at the United Nations General Assembly 
on the 17th of September 1959, and these were his words. In those territories where different races or tribes live side by side, the task is to ensure that all the people may enjoy security and freedom, and the chance to contribute as individuals to the progress and well-being of these countries. We, that is the British, reject the idea of any inherent superiority of one race over another. Our policy, therefore, is non-racial. It offers a future in which Africans, Europeans, Asians, and the peoples of the Pacific and others with whom we are concerned will all play their full part as citizens in the country where they live and in which feelings of race will be submerged in loyalty to new nations that in the small world of today, isolationism is out of date. And more than that, offers no assurance of security. The fact is that in the modern world, no country, not even the greatest, can live for itself alone. Nearly 2,000 years ago, at a time when, you might say, the whole of the civilized world was comprised within the confines of the Roman Empire. St. Paul proclaimed one of the great truths of history. We are all members one of another. During this 20th century, this eternal truth has taken on a new and exciting significance. It has always been impossible the individual man to live in isolation from his fellows in the home, the tribe, the village, or the city. Today it is impossible for nations to live in isolation from one another. What Dr. John Don said of individual <coughs> men 300 years ago is true today of my country, of your country, and of every country in the world. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind. Therefore, never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. All nations are now interdependent upon one another. In conclusion, may I just say this. I've spoken frankly about the difficulties between our two countries, the differences between our two countries, in their approach to one of the great current problems with which each has to deal within its own sphere of responsibility. These differences are well known. They are matters of public knowledge, indeed of public controversy. I would have been less than honest if by remaining silent on them, I'd seem to imply that they did not exist. We must face the differences, but let us try to see a little beyond them, down the long vista of the future. I hope I am indeed confident. In another 50 years, we will look back to the differences that exist now between us as mere matters of historical interest. For as time passes and one generation yields to another, human problems change and fade. Let us remember these truths. Let us therefore resolve to build and not to destroy. Let us also remember that weakness comes from division. And in words familiar to you, Strength from unity.